Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. It's a Sunday, so that means I am joined by Kevin Flaherty. Really excited to do these Sunday podcasts throughout the course of the Kansas football season. Kevin, it was week zero this weekend. Football was played in Europe. Did you watch any of those games? I, I didn't. I'm not a huge fan of, of the week zero. I like everything to kind of start at once. Plus, the games are terrible. Did you watch much much week one, Kevin? Yeah, I watched all of the Notre Dame game. Um, I uh, kind of wanted to see, you know, Sam Hartman and how that offense was, was looking mm-hmm. and everything. I watched a, a little bit of uh, – watched a while, I guess, of New Mexico State with them being – kind of pit state west and and everything and so they're uh they're kind of fun it, i was a little sad though with usc being on pac-12 network you know that usc was the uh was the best team to play you know you couldn't at least watch a pac-12 game point and nobody could watch it you know so so you could everybody could watch new mexico state umass which was on espn but struggled to watch USC and Caleb Williams. And so, you know, I, I saw the highlights from that one. But, uh, but yeah, I, I got bits and pieces of, of all of those games at least. Yeah, and you wonder why the Pac-12 is going under. Can't even watch the a team that can make the college football playoff. Like, get we'll, out of here. We'll, 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 won't be that issue next year when USC has the Big Ten Network. Mm-mm. Oh, yeah, that's, that's actually a really good point. <laughs> I feel like the Big Ten Network's maybe a little more accessible than – Oh, a ton. Um, a ton. Pac-12 yeah, I mean, network. is the Pac-12 network even as accessible as Longhorn Network? Like, I'm not trying to be a jerk about <laughs> this. I'm just saying, like, when I lived in Gardner, Kansas, I had access to the Longhorn Network, and I don't have access to Pac-12 Network. So, oh. so for all I know, and it may be just where we're at in the country or whatever, but it might have been easier to get Longhorn Network than it was to get it for an entire conference. Probably. Probably. And that's our realignment talk for today. There you go. Um, it's, it's we're going to give you a, a season preview today. We're going to talk about kind of our outlook for the year. Kevin and I will both give our win total predictions. We will talk about some of the games that are most intriguing to us. And then we'll dive into some specifics. We'll pick some players in terms of who's going to lead the team in sacks, who's going to lead the team in tackles, receiving yards, um, things of that nature. And then we'll wrap it up with some talk about Missouri State and just season openers. So, Kevin, last Friday, I put out a story that was kind of my game-by-game predictions for KU football this year. I've pulled up the schedule here for the YouTube audience. I'll be honest. I've been on the 6-6 six and six train for a while, and as I looked through the schedule, I kind of kept coming back to 7-5. and five. And I've tried not to get over my skis on this because I think you can look at the schedule and I think you can talk yourself into nine wins, right? Sure. But is that necessarily realistic? Is that how it's going to play out? I don't know. So I think for me, I look at the schedule and, you know, I think there are going to be a lot of coin flip games, but I've come out with the final record of seven and five. If you want to see my exact picks, you can head over to fog.net. I've got them up there on the website. Um, for VIP subscribers. But for you, Kevin, when you look at the schedule here, right, the three non-conference games at home to Missouri State, at home to Illinois, at Nevada, um, you get into Big 12 play. Like when you look at the schedule, like what are you coming out with? What's kind of your most common result when you play out the schedule in your head? Yeah, it's it's fascinating because I I do think I'm kind of on the seven and five train. And yet at the same time, you know, I look at it and I see, you know, I did my predictions for every Big 12 school mm. um, for the month of September. And I wound up having Kansas four and one coming out of September, you know, winning, you know, beating Missouri State, mm-hmm. winning Illinois. I'm sure we'll talk about that game more. You know, that to me is the biggest swing game on this entire schedule and, and maybe the most important game. Had him beating Nevada and BYU to start the season 4-0 and then falling at Texas to, to kind of open the month. Um, I, I think 7-5 and five is kind of where I'm at. But at the same time, if Kansas does put itself in a spot where it's 4-1 and one coming out of September, like you're saying, at that point, you're looking at a scenario where eight wins is in play, nine wins is in play. I'm not saying they're going to win nine games. I mean, I'm sure somebody will – 
we'll bring this back and, you know, and say, Oh yeah, Kevin was, was nine and three. Um, but at the same time, that that's the way college football works, right? Is that momentum. And, mm-hmm. and I think last year when you saw Kansas open five and Oh, had Jalen Daniels stayed healthy over and been able to play out that schedule, Kansas would have won eight or so games. I think with the confidence level they were playing with, with the momentum that they had at that point. And so I think this is a team that that can compete with every team Mm -hmm. on that schedule. I think you saw that quite a bit last year. You know, there were some games where maybe Kansas wasn't competitive for stretches of certain games, but this is also a Kansas team that to be totally blunt about it, you know, maybe they should have beaten TCU who went to the national Mm -hmm. title game. They had their chances in that game and they didn't play a fully polished game in in that one. There were mistakes and there were mistakes on the final drive that, you know, had Kansas pulled those off, you know, maybe, maybe Kansas would have gotten to its sixth win in its sixth game. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at in terms of seven and five. I think you can see scenarios where, especially if that Illinois game, you know, if that's a game that Kansas loses, particularly maybe in a certain fashion, you can start looking at it and saying, oh, now now maybe you're looking at the under, maybe you're looking at six and six. Mm-hmm. But I, I think seven and five is kind of a, a strong point, especially when you look at, I'm not 100% sure on Oklahoma State, you know, with how much they struggled at the end of last year with all the things that went on in the portal with that team. Mm-hmm. I get that it's in still water and that makes it really, really tough. But this Kansas team has shown that, that they aren't afraid to go into hostile road atmospheres and, and, and play. And, and then the other one that I think is interesting that probably a lot of us had, you know, maybe penciled in as a win, but thought would be a tough game is that Iowa state game and with the Iowa state personnel losses and things like that with the gambling and and everything else, you know, that's maybe another game where you look at it and say, man, this was maybe a coin flip game where now maybe you say 60, 40 Kansas or or whatever else, but I think seven and five is certainly possible. What, what do you think? And, and where are the, what are the games here that you kind of have, have circled, if you will? Yeah, I think the first one right is Illinois. I think sure. so much of that is equivalent to last year where I think you look at the West Virginia game and I think the way it played out where, you know, the slow starts have to stop this year. Kansas yeah. can't start slowing games if they're going to be competitive and, and be consistently competitive throughout games. Um, but I think that West Virginia game did so much for their confidence where then they walked into Houston and just, again, slow start, but then really turned it up and walked all over them. And then, you know, the Duke game is another one where I think a lot of that was just confidence building over the first kind of four weeks of the season. Um, and so I think Illinois plays a very similar role here where if KU does end up beating Illinois, that's going to be so much for them in terms of confidence because Illinois is a team that's going to have multiple draft picks along the defensive line, sure. right? I believe they play a 3 4 scheme where I think they've got one of their kind of defensive ends that's going to be a hand on the ground guy. He could be a draft pick. And you're looking at both of their kind of outside linebacker edge rusher guys being really talented. One of them, I believe, was a freshman All-American last year. The other one has a lot of production in his college career. That defensive front is going to tell us a lot about where Kansas' offensive line is at. Then you flip to the other side of the ball, and you look at what Illinois' offensive line can be. They return multiple starters. That's a group that I think, you know, you know Brett Bioma, their teams are going to be physical. And they're going to be really good in the offensive line. I think they've recruited to that. And so I look at this game and I say, okay, if Kansas wins it, that means they held their own in the trenches, which means that's really good looking at another team like BYU coming in in whatever it will be two weeks from then. So I think the Illinois game for me is probably the one that I think is going to be a really big litmus test for this team because I just think Illinois is strong in the areas where I think you and I both talked about at the end of last season, right, Kevin? Where do Kansas need to take the biggest step forward? Well, holding their own against really physical teams, right? We saw what KU could do against a Houston team that maybe has better quarterback, skill position players, um, even a TCU team that I think had team speed, but maybe was the most physically imposing at the point of attack. And so I think for me, this Illinois game, I just think it's going to tell you so much about where the team's at. And if Kansas does win that game, I think it's one of those where it bodes well, not only for the confidence, but it means a lot that they've 
shown those areas where they needed to improve that they have taken that next step. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've talked about it on the show, but I think Illinois is a good indicator about the BYU game as well, because I think BYU is similarly going to try and play very physically going to try and run that big running back, you know, right through the middle of the defense and, and run it, run them a whole bunch of times. And, and if you can't stop it, you're probably going to lose. And if you can slow it down, you know, maybe not stop it. You're, you're, you're going to have a chance to, to win mm-hmm. that game. And so I, I do think, you know, if you lose that Illinois game and you lose it in a fashion where it's just, Hey man, Kansas got beat up front, you know, on both sides of the ball, even potentially, I think that starts to raise questions, not necessarily for the very next week against Nevada, but the week after that, the Big 12 opener against BYU, because that's an area where I think BYU typically surprises a lot of people. And, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of these kids go on Mormon missions. And because of that, you know, they're a couple years older. You don't have you know, the, the 18, 19 year old kid playing sometimes, sometimes that's a 23 year old kid or 24 year old kid. And that's an area where through the years, I mean, you can, you can go back 10 years, 15 years, whatever, where BYU has occasionally surprised Mm. people where they've said, Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe how physical they were with regard to, to where Mm. we were at. But I, I think, you know, the Illinois game is the easiest one to circle and say, you know, hey, this this will tell a lot about Kansas' this season. It, it's the first big game and everything. You win that game, I think that snowballs in a good way in terms of momentum, in, in terms of setting you up for the, for the next few games and, and everything. One game I, I do want to talk about, mm-hmm. um, and, and I probably shouldn't put this on the record, but we've talked about it, and – and you uh, and I and Ryan from you know our, our Sunflower Recruiting podcast have talked about it. I think Kansas gets Kansas State this year. Um, and, mm. and I know you know in your article, I don't want to give away spoilers. You you may have had a, a different opinion on that game, yeah. but when when I look at Kansas and Kansas State last year, I didn't think that Kansas State was. I didn't see the gap there being as big as it has been in previous years. And I know that Kansas has had games, even where they've had poor teams where they've hung around with Kansas state and maybe lost by a touchdown or or whatever, but you could still kind of look at it and say, okay, like Kansas state really did not play well this game. You know, it it wasn't, it, it was more fool's gold. Whereas I think in last year's game, you can look at it and say, the special teams mistakes, some of the other errors that they had um, and different things like that. I felt like separated the two teams more than just saying, Hey, Kansas state is this much better than Kansas. And and I think Kansas state has a chance to be a similar team this year to what they were last year. I know some Kansas state fans have told me that they're going to be better this year than, than they were last year. I don't know that I'm, 100% 100% there. I, I think there's a chance they're similar. I think they could be slightly worse. I think mm-hmm. Kansas is going to be better. And I think that one of the areas that they're going to be better is going to be in special teams. I, I think we've talked about on this show specifically why that might be from just increased roster depth and talent. You know, the guys who are chasing kickoffs are going to be better than the guys who were chasing kickoffs before the kicking game is going to be better than it was before and all of those different things. I think when you look at all of that, when you look at at Kansas's level, maybe rising a little bit because whatever Kansas's record is this year, I think there's a very real chance Kansas is better this year than it was last year and could even be at five and seven Mm. because of the, because of the schedule. But I do think Kansas is going to be better um overall even if the record doesn't say that and so i look at you know kansas state's level kind of being here you know maybe even dropping slightly and i think kansas was maybe here and i see them rising up a little bit i and with that being in lawrence you know everything else i that's a game that you know if i'm picking an upset at this point you know i I would pick kansas to to win that game and like i said i'll probably probably regret putting this thing on record what's kind of Kind of your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think for me it's a. I okay, so here, here, all right. Here's a good equivalent for me. Um, covering Iowa State, right? Iowa State and Iowa have a big rivalry, and sure. Iowa State could could not beat Iowa for a long time. I was never really going to pick Iowa State, sure, because what has history shown you? And you can continue to pick Iowa State in those games, and you will continue to be wrong. Now, last year was the year that it happened, right? And I, I just approach in terms of picking games and trying to figure out what wins are. I, I chalk it up as a loss. And if it's a win, then that's great for Kansas because obviously it's going to be big for recruiting. It's going to be really big for, I think, the perception within just locally. Um, but I would also say it'd be really good for morale. And But again, it's just not something I'm going to pick. I think you made a really good point in the special teams front. I was looking back through that game. And I kind of forgotten that the exact sequence that had happened, but K forces a three and out to start the game. Sure. And then OJ Burroughs muffs the punt. K State gets to the five yard line. They score. And then I think two drives later, Trevor Wilson makes a terrible decision to bring the ball out. He gets tackled, I believe, at like the, the 10 or the 12. And then there's a, a penalty half the distance to the goal. And then there's a safety. And so all of a sudden you're looking at KU basically just pinning two hands behind their back and trying to fight in that game where I think for a good majority of that game, when the game state was maybe a little more even, I think Kansas was in it. And so I think there's, again, I'm not going to pick it, but I think it's one of those things where, yeah, if Kansas beat K-State this year, I would not be, I would not be surprised, right? I think it could happen. And but I'm it's just, it, you know, I'm and I'm not saying Kansas is catching is going to catch K State as a program this year. I just think that the the scenario, you know, it may be that they go back to Manhattan next year, and you know things are are wildly different. But I think yeah. that with this specific Kansas State team, with this specific Kansas team, uh, I think there's a good chance for that. And, and with where the where the game occurs, if Kansas is healthy. In that game, you know, I, I think, and that's a question in and of itself. Mm-hmm. You know, I I think that that's a that's a very real possibility, and, and you make a really good point. And and to take it back to a, a Kansas centric thing, Kansas fans get mad when anybody picks anyone other than Kansas to win the Big Twelve in basketball, yeah. right? Like every, like every year that somebody picks, you know, oh man, I can't believe they picked Baylor, like. Do they not realize that Kansas wins this league all the time? You know, and and from a mm-hmm. Chiefs standpoint, people now are you know they're like, oh my gosh, ESPN's picking the Chargers to win the league again, or whatever else. And so I do get yeah. that you look at the history of it and you say, you know, hey, that's that's maybe not the most likely thing to happen. But I think yeah. there are a lot of similarities. I feel like between you know, sort of the start of the Mangino era and the start of the Lance Leipold era, you know, Mm -hmm. bowl game in year two where the program improves, you know, year three, Kansas was probably a better team under Mangino, but they lost a lot of close games. And so the record wasn't as good. Um, Kansas state fell back after winning a big 12 title and Kansas beat them in, in Lawrence that year. And I don't expect Kansas State to fall back that much this year. Uh, but I do think that, you know, it's it's similar and that Kansas probably proved some stuff to itself in last year's game despite the results of, hey, we, we were within two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, and the reason they were up two touchdowns is because of mistakes that we made. And mm-hmm. I think we've talked a lot about this, and I, I realize I'm, I'm running on, but – we've talked a lot about the importance of Lance Leipold's attitude with regard to building this program, right? The fact that after Kansas lost to TCU last year, the message was not, Oh gee, great. We were close to a ranked team, whatever. Lance Leipold said, you know what? Like we needed to be cleaner to win this game. And we weren't. Mm. And that was the right message. I thought, because it wasn't putting it on, well, gosh, I'm so proud of my guys. And, and I'm not saying he wasn't proud of his team for the way that they played, but it was just saying, you know, there are still things that we could have done better 
where we would have won the game. And Mm -hmm. I I think that that's been an important emphasis of theirs and and everything else. And and I think that that's something that they can take from last year's Kansas State game where it's, hey, you played on an even game state, like you said, with Kansas State for a portion of this game. And really, you know, a lot of the separation was was self-imposed. And and you clean those things up and – and I'm not saying Kansas wins, but I am saying that you clean those things up and maybe you're in a one score game in the fourth quarter mm-hmm. where things could go either way. Yeah, I agree. And plus, I mean, you want to play the, the health game, right? K State, I'll pull it up. K State's bye week is after the, the fourth week of the season. That's sure. a terrible bye week. So it's the equivalent of KU having a bye week after the BYU game. And look yep. at that schedule. Look how many consistent weeks of football that is before those two teams play. And I think we saw last year, right? KU had a late bye week, and it really impacted them, right? Towards they were the so worn down. And then yeah. when they came off the bye week was when they showed up at Oklahoma State lo- or against Oklahoma State looking totally youthful, oh, right? Well, a, a walking corpse of an Oklahoma State team. Well, well not, sure. But, not I mean, but I mean, history. everybody – did everybody not look, you know, quicker and more full of? Uh, I think I think everyone I mean, that not look quick against that Oklahoma State team. That uh, Oklahoma State uh, team was a walking corpse. Again, they, they were. The and that's why I'm not sure. Hmm. You know, I hate to change the subject, but that's why I'm not sure on that Oklahoma State team is because the second half of last year they were the worst team in the Big Twelve, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I think they really were over the last, you know. However many games, I thought they were the worst team in the Big 12 down the stretch. And I'm not saying that a lot of that wasn't, you know, chemistry or, or whatever it could have been. Some of it was injury related, but you have all those issues. Then you have the transfer portal doing what it did to that team. Mike Gundy is incredibly consistent. That schedule is so easy. And yet at the same time, part of me is just kind of like, man, that's, that's a big rebound to make from where they were at at the end of last year, especially when you're losing some of your better players. Yeah. And look, I mean, Oklahoma state was down several starters on both sides of the ball. You know, it's one of those where I think obviously you got to go in the game, right? We've seen Kansas uh, obviously under past coaching staffs and a lot less competent coaching staffs, right? <laughs> Drop games like that where the other team walks in as a corpse and KU still finds a way to lose it. And so, obviously, you have to win those games. And I think that's the thing for Kansas this year is can they limit those mistakes to where when a team does come in to Lawrence or KU goes on the road and that team isn't on their A game, is KU able to capitalize? And so, that for me is like so much of this season, right, it's just about closing the margin or widening the margin, I'm sorry, and really shutting down a lot of the errors that we saw last year. I think special sure. teams will help with that. I think defensively, can you not give up – big plays through the air and stop the run game a little bit better. I was looking at some of the penalty numbers too, Kevin. It's kind of crazy. Like K, I forgot how many KU in terms of the number of penalties was like seventh or something in the conference or six, but in terms of penalty yards, they're like fourth because yep. so many of the penalties they gave up were pass interference. Yep. And so it's things like that, that I think if Kansas is able to do right, that'll really help um, over the course of the season. So we've done what Kansas's final record will be. Um, do you want to start? We're going to pick up some specific stats and who could lead at KU where I'll let sure. you pick offensive side of the ball first or defensive side of the ball first. You know, the defense I feel like is going to be so important this year in terms of mm. games. It's not just being exciting, but being good. So let's, yes. let's start with the defense. All righty. I will pick, let's start really basic. Who right. will lead Kansas in tackles this year. For reference, last year, Kenny Logan led the team with 106 tackles in 13 games. Rich Miller was second with 94. Craig Young was third with 60. And then Lonnie Phelps was fourth with 57. And then fifth, Romello Dotson with 54. Who would you pick to lead the team in tackles this year? Oh, that's tough, right? Because you figure Kenny Logan's numbers are probably going to drop. Even if he's effective, even if he's effective, you would think that they're going to drop because potentially the people in front of him are better. And so the football doesn't get to him as often. But even beyond that, you know, we've talked about it here. Marvin Grant's kind of ascension and and everything, you would think that he's going to take some reps from Kenny Logan. And so 
But the flip side of that is we've had the exact same discussion about J.B. Brown coming in and yeah. potentially them, you know, getting Rich Miller more of a rest than he had last year. So I'm going to go ahead and take Rich Miller on this. But at the same time, I do think that there's scenarios where both of those guys see their tackle numbers maybe drop from where they were a year ago. Yeah, I think in an ideal scenario, right? I don't think you'd want Kenny Logan having another 100 tackles. Sure. Um, I still might pick – I still am going to pick him to lead the team in tackles. All right. Um, I just think stylistically with the way that Kansas does deploy Kenny, he is going to be in a position to make a lot of tackles. And look, I've made my opinions on the, you know, on the topic known that, you know, I think Marvin Grant is going to play. I think he's a good player. Um, I think probably higher upside than Kenny, but I think Kenny's still the guy that they're going to ride with this year. And so I think that's what makes me think. I still think he'll get there. I will say, I think it'll be under a hundred tackles. How about yeah, that? I would agree. Maybe it'll be a little more evenly spread around. I thought it was really interesting looking at it too, right? Melo Dotson fifth on the list. Yeah. I kind of wonder if we might see some more some more linebackers in there this year. But again, I think you'll also see teams still continue to try and run the ball outside against KU's corners because even if they are improved physically, um, I think you just look at them in the eye test and you say, okay, that's probably where you're going to try and run, get to the outside, and make them tackle consistently. Yeah, I think so. And, and especially, you know, if it, it's funny because uh, if Kansas is better in the middle, then you're going to wind up trying to go to the outside because you're not going to want to go up the middle. Mm-hmm. If Kansas is not great in the middle, Kansas is going to put more defenders in the middle and you're still going to go to the outside probably to, to try and get. And so I, I do think that the those outside guys are really going to be tested physically this year. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Who will lead KU in tackles for loss this season? You want to take this one first? Sure, I can. And so for reference, right, last year, Lonnie Phelps led KU with 11 and a half. Jeremy Robinson had eight and a half. Tywan Burial had six. Craig Young had five and a half. And then Caleb Sampson had four. That's the top five. Um, Tackles for loss. I'm going to pick Jeremy Robinson. I think you're going to look at him and I, he's going to be the breakout player this year. If he can stay healthy, he's the guy that, you know, I think it's every time he's played right last year, the season before that, when he has played and gotten opportunities, he's produced. And so I don't see why that won't continue this year. I think picking him for tackles for loss is also different than picking him for sacks because we'll have a sacks category here in a second. So I'm going to pick Jeremy for tackles for loss this year. Who are you going to go with? Yeah, I think I'll go with Jeremy, too. I think there's a really interesting scenario here, though, where Kansas maybe uses Craig Young a little bit more, you know, as a pass rusher. And so he gets a chance to to kind of get in the backfield and you see his numbers make a jump up. And that mm-hmm. wouldn't surprise me at all to see Craig Young sort of challenge with that, because I think you may see him maybe a little bit more doing that sort of stuff as opposed to, you know, Last year, he was a nickel corner pretty much at times and, and, you know, back in pass coverage. I'm not saying he won't do that, but I do think that it would not surprise me to see Craig Young get more opportunities to to get into the backfield and rush the passer. Yeah, I think both he, J.B. Brown, Tywin Berryhill, I think KU is going to be a little bit more aggressive this year. I think at times the blitz calls, I think we talked about it maybe a little bit last year, but I think at times last year, the timing of those blitz calls felt a little bit off where – it'd be kind of third and long and there'd be a blitz and it's really, you know, and then I think we saw plenty of times, right. KU'd give up a, a big passing play when that happened, but I think KU get more creative. Um, as for who will lead KU in sacks, I think this is a really interesting discussion because obviously Lonnie Phelps had seven last year and then Craig young was second with four and a half. Yep. Then Jeremy Robinson with three, Caleb Samson with two and a half, Taiwan Barry Hill with two. Um, Total aside, I think Barry Hill, J.B. Brown, and Craig Young will all have two or more this year. Yep. Prediction. Write it down. Make uh, sure. Make sure we keep it so I can get cold takes exposed in in <laughs> December. Um, I'll let you pick the sacks though. You can you can pick. Ooh, I, I feel like the the obvious pick is Robinson because mm-hmm. if he's your best pass rusher, you know, you feel like, and if he takes the leap that a lot of us think he's going to, yeah, um, he he's that guy. Uh, but the other part of it is, is I think a lot of, at least early on, 
a lot of people are going to go in feeling like Jeremy Robinson is the guy. And so I think he's going to get chipped. I think, you know, you're going to see some stuff. I'm going to go with a little bit of a wild card here. I'm going to go with Austin Booker Mm -hmm. on the thoughts that basically early on when the schedule maybe isn't quite as tough, et cetera, and people are basically saying, hey, Jeremy Robinson is the guy that we need to block, that Austin Booker is going to get four or five sacks maybe you know, yeah. through September and then add a couple more in conference play, wind up with around seven and lead the team. Who would you have second? Would you go with Jeremy? You know, I would either go with Jeremy or Craig Young because I do think yeah. that Craig Young's going to rush the pass for more, and I think we saw him last year have a talent for that. He's just such a freak athlete. And, and I think, you know, there, there are situations where you can bring him on blitzes, but I also think, quite frankly, there are situations where you can just put him up as a straight up, you know, stand over the edge guy and let him go. And, and so uh, I think I would probably go with Jeremy, but I think Craig Young is right there. What do you think? Yeah. So I am going to pick Jeremy just because I, I agree that he is going to get Delaney Phelps treatment. I think he's better suited to that though. I think physically yeah. like Lonnie Phelps is really fast coming off the edge, but I think Jeremy has the blend of the athleticism, the length, right? Sure. I think that people, some people maybe don't remember about Lonnie is that he didn't really have great length. And I think the the testing numbers showed that right when he went to the, co- the combine and it's in um, uh, senior bowl and stuff like that. So I, I will go with Jeremy second. I'll pick JB Brown. Oh, because I like it. I think the athleticism that he shows is yeah. something they're going to want to use where I think he's a better athlete than Tywin Berryhill. And I think Tywin Berryhill was so close so many times over the course of the season. I don't have the the hurries number in front of me, but it just anecdotally, I felt like Berryhill, you saw him get really close and get pressures. And I feel like, you know, J.B. Brown might have that half step to where those turn into sacks. So he'd be the one I'd go with second, just because I think at times you're going to see him come off the edge and whether it be kind of blitz stunts, things like that. I think he'll be used pretty creatively because he's just physically, he's strong. I think he can't handle himself against offensive tackles. And I think too, right. He's just got that speed. So. Yeah, I get that. I, I think too, there's a scenario where exactly what you're talking about happens but Barry Hill just gets that extra half step yeah, this year totally. where Barry Hill winds up and, and I'm not saying he leads the team, but I think there's a scenario where Barry Hill gets home four and a half, five mm-hmm. times this year on plays that he could have made last year, but was just shy on mm-hmm. it. And so I, I do think that's interesting. I agree with you um, on, on Robinson in general too. I think one of the things that surprises you a little bit when you watch him on tape is how agile he is you know the way that he can kind of change direction sometimes for a bigger you know bodied longer guy you know he'll he'll start to to kind of get the outside shoulder and the offensive tackle will be leaning that way and he'll change direction really well and so I do think his strength his length all of those things Robinson I think is uh is the pick but like I said I if I'm going off the wall a little bit and I kind of wanted to, you know, I'm going to go with Booker basically like capitalizing on the attention that gets paid to, to Robinson to try and slow him down. Yeah. And I don't think the guy that we'll see what the, I mean, uh, the depth chart will come out around 10, 10 30 on Monday morning. So I could be wrong, but um, the guy who I think a lot of people believed would start at the head, at the beginning of camp, got banged up. So Austin Booker got more opportunities, but yeah. you know, if Hatcher does start, I don't think he's going to be the guy that's converting on a bunch of sacks. That's just my feeling. Um, let's switch to offense. Okay. Sure. Do you want to pick? All right. So here, I'll give you a choice. I like choices. I hate making decisions. Um, <laughs> so you can pick, uh, do you want to do receiving yards or total touchdowns? Ooh, I think total touchdowns sounds fascinating. So who will lead KU in total touchdowns? If we go to last year, right? You want to look at your total touchdowns from scrimmage. Devin Neal had 10. Jalen Daniels had seven. Luke Grimm, Mason Fairchild, Daniel Highshaw Jr. all had six. And that rounds out the top five. Who do you think leads KU in total touchdowns this year? As as much as I would Who would be your top two, actually? Who would be your top two? Okay. As much as I would love – 
for yeah. Daniel Hyshaw to put together a fully healthy year. Mm-hmm. He just hasn't quite shown that yet. And so I, I think that Devin Neal is probably the safe bet again. Um, I'll, I'll be interested to see, though, what happens with with Jalen and, and running, right? Because mm-hmm. on one hand, you know, a lot of the work that they did with him in the weight room and everything was to allow him to run more and, and take more shots and things like that. At the same time, you you look at the Arkansas game in, in particular, um, and, and after he came back from his injury, I mean, it was – KU was playing more sort of spread and shred. And so you wouldn't have the rushing touchdowns or as many of those in those situations uh, for Daniels. But uh, I'll go with Devin Neal. I think that's that's the best uh, – yeah. the best option there. I'm going to go with – for number two – Ooh, gosh, that's that's a tough one. Because um, I think they'll be scattered kind of all over the place. I may go with Jalen anyway, just because, hey, he may get some quarterback sneaks here and there. He may whatever. I, I think I'll go with Jalen anyway, but I really think that you're looking at a group of guys between, say, four and seven touchdowns. It mm-hmm. could be, what, like six deep, it, it feels like? Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. I think the the right answer is those two. I think Devin Neal being the first and then Jalen Daniels being the second. Um, you know, yeah, I'd probably say those two. Um, for fun, I might say Luke Grimm yeah, because if he can stay healthy, I think he's yeah. a guy that will end up getting those opportunities. And I, I think KU is going to get more creative this year with motion. Um and finding ways to get guys like Luke the ball in, in space. And I think, right, so much of having this extra experience, I think, has allowed Andy Kotelnicki the opportunity now to add more wrinkles. And it's very apparent that he's a big motion guy. And you see it so many times with the tight ends, how much they motion and how much they move around. And I think you're going to see something very, very similar with the wide receivers this year. And I think a guy who is loose, who is shifty, who can fit that is Luke. Yeah. I don't know if like Lawrence Arnold could do that. I think Quentin Skinner could on some end around stuff, but I think consistently, I think Luke Grimm could be in a, in a position to do that. So he'd be kind of the guy that maybe I'd pick third or maybe if Jalen, if they, if they really pull back on the rushing, uh, maybe that's what happens. Um, but that'll lead me in then to who do you think will lead KU in receiving yards this year? Yeah, I think that's Luke and, Grimm. Oh, here, I, I'll, I'll give you from last year. I, I forgot okay. to do that. All right. All right. Um, so Lawrence Arnold had 716. Yep. Okay. And he averaged 16 yards a catch. So um, Luke Grimm was second with 623 yards receiving, 12 yards per catch. Mason Fairchild, 443, 12.7 yards per catch. Quentin Skinner, 440 receiving yards with 16.9 yards per catch and then rounding it out jared casey 224 receiving yards 12.4 yards per catch yeah i think i'm gonna go with luke grimm this year but i do think that there's a scenario where this is the year and i i don't want to act like lj arnold wasn't really good last year because he Mm -hmm. was but I also think there's a scenario where LJ Arnold takes it another step up and becomes a thousand yard receiver. I really do. Mm-hmm. I think he's got that kind of ability on the outside. He can do a lot of different things, you know, within the offense. And he's also somebody that, you know, with the previous question, he's somebody that Kansas feels good about throwing the ball up to in a 50 50 situation around the end zone. So while I do think that there's a scenario where LJ could be, you know, an all 12 type guy, I just, I feel like with the way this Kansas offense is probably going to go this year, Luke Grimm is really going to get fed the football. And Mm -hmm. and I think that he's the guy that I would predict to lead the team in in rushing yards or in receiving yards. I think that, I think that you made a, a good point. Um, about all the motion and things that they're going to do and everything, and so I do think that that I'd pick uh, I'd pick Luke Grimm on that one. How about you? I'll say Quentin Skinner. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think it, it's time for him, and I, I'm a real big believer in what he can do. I think he, from the sound of things, 
He's a guy that has really improved his speed, which considering what his skill set was to begin with is really impressive. And now I think he's someone that can really hone in on the route tree and become more versatile in what he can run. Um, And so, yeah, I I think Quentin, I I think he's going to get enough of the deep shots because I think KU's run game will be better this year because I think the offensive line will just take a step forward. I don't know if they're going to be dominant consistently, but I think they'll be better. So the run game will be better, and I think you'll see more shots. And this isn't to say he's going to lead the team in receptions. This is receiving yeah. yards. So I think you give him enough deep shots, and I think he's, he's going to be he's the guy lead the, that can do it. He's going to lead the team in yards for catch. Like, I mean, that's – you know, maybe Trevor Wilson could could compete with him for yards yeah. per catch. But but I, I think Quentin Skinner leads the team in yards per catch. You know, he's – I think he's going to be at 18, maybe even 20 in, in yards per catch. And so, like you said, it's not like Quentin's going to be an 80 catch guy this year, I don't think, but the ones that he catches are are going to matter. They're going to be down the field. Yeah. And so I think for me, like the reasoning I think is he's going to have the big plays, yeah. right? I think he's going to have your, your 30 or your 40 or 50 yard gains, but I think you'll also see a lot more of the 20, 25 yard games, the intermediate routes where that can then help, right, add some of that chunk yard to where he's able to get over 100 yards, maybe a little more often, a little more consistently. Um, so that's what we got for the season predictions. We'll have to revisit some of those at the end of the year, in addition to our win totals. Um, let's talk week one, because I think Missouri State's better than Tennessee Tech, yes. and I'm not necessarily expecting a 35, 40-point blowout this week, but – in a season opener for a team like this, Kevin, what are some of the things you're looking for that you want to like would make you feel better going into the Illinois game? Yeah. The main thing I thought against Tennessee tech, and like you said, I mean, Tennessee tech was, I'm not trying to disparage anybody, but they (laughs) were, but they were not a good FCS team. You know, I mean, that was, that was the thing. There are some FCS teams like North Dakota state or, or, or South Dakota state, you know, they're, yeah, they're, they're, are FCS teams that can throw a challenge into you if you aren't if you aren't playing well. And I, I think that Tennessee Tech, unfortunately for that program, was a team that went into that game last year where you were saying, hey, I don't really expect this team to, to challenge Kansas, even with, to that point, how much Kansas had, had struggled. And so even so, heading into that game, the thing that I was looking for, it wasn't Jalen Daniels, it wasn't, you know, I want to see up front, and, and I mm-hmm. think, you know, against uh, against Missouri State, as much as I wanted to see Kansas up front on offense against Tennessee Tech, because I wanted them to line up and basically look like a Big 12 team running the ball against Tennessee Tech, I want to see the defensive line uh, against Missouri State. You know, I want to see that group – get home. I want to see Devin Phillips, you know, clogging up the line. Those are, those are the things that if you expect Kansas to go seven and five, I think you want that defensive line mm-hmm. to show up and, and really dominate that game. How about you? Yeah. I obviously I'll have my kind of three things I'm looking for later in the week, but I think for me, obviously I think first and foremost, it, it's Jalen Daniels. Sure. Right. We'll I'll get the official. Yeah, yeah. We'll get the official update on Monday from Lance Leipold. I, I don't know. Um, it's been something that's kind of kept under wraps, so it's perfectly fine. Um, I th- he needs to play. He needs sure. to play a half because what I go back to is that Texas game and how rusty he looked coming off the injury first game in about a month for him, right? And his first play from scrimmage was almost a pick six. Yep. His first pass was almost a pick six. And like he, he, you can't have his first snaps of the season coming against Illinois. Yeah. If they are, that's just not good. And you don't want the first hits he takes. Yeah, like just get out there, get a feel for it. And so I think that for me is the biggest thing. And then, yeah, in the trenches, can can Armaje Reed Adams go pancake some dudes for half? And then I think also for me, anytime you play an FCS team, right, it's if if KU can just take care of business. Yeah. Get up 21 nothing into the first quarter. Or 24. How about 24 nothing? Let's see a field goal. Let's see a good made field goal from maybe like 40 yards. That'd make me feel really good about special teams. Well, shoot, now that that you say this, Lance Leipold's going to take a knee on third down to set up a 40-yard field goal (laughs) so that that he can say, you see, Swain, you you see what we did there? But 
but no, I mean, I, I agree with all that. You want the special teams to look really, really good. And yeah, it would be great if you could see a return touchdown or, or something in there, obviously, is, as well would be. Well, now I'm remembering, too, there's a blocked field goal taken for a touchdown last year. Right. And that didn't mean anything for the year in special teams. So who knows? But, yeah, I forgot about that. They did block some field goals early last year. Yeah. Yeah, so- all right. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's like you said, taking care of business, executing, being relatively clean. But I think more, than, you know, like I said, just this sounds like an arrogant thing, but look like <laughs> a Big 12 team playing an FCS team. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I totally agree. It should be fun. It should be a fun night. We'll see how hot it is. It's nice. It was nicer this Sunday than it was last Sunday when. Oh, yeah. Lawrence was the hottest place on the face of the planet. Um, I'm interested to see what the crowd's like. Really interested to see what the crowd's like. I think season opener is always a challenge, especially that being a Friday night. Um, high school football is going on. So interested to see what the crowd's like. Should be great to be back in the stadium, though. I'm looking forward to it. I've, I've never been – I'm like rearing to go. Can't wait for this week. It's going to be so <laughs> much fun. Can't, can't wait for this. He's ready to strap him up. But yeah, I'm ready. Look, Kevin – July gets really boring. It gets really boring. And then you get into kind of camp and the first kind of two weeks of camp are fun, right? You're at practice. And then kind of the last like week or 10 days, it's like, okay, you kind of heard a lot of the same things and it's a lot of the same stuff. And now it's like, let's go. It's new. Every single week, there's going to be new stuff to talk about, which I think is really exciting. Cause I think for me, right. Writing VIP updates, I'll peel back the curtain here for people that have, sat around for 46 minutes listening to us talk but like <laughs> you write the vip updates and i feel like sometimes i'm like all right i think oh, i've written about this i've written about this like is there anything new i can write about and i think there's a point in late august when you kind of run out of stuff to write about you're repeating, repeating you, about. you're repeating yourself on a lot of stuff too yeah because it's like well i wrote that austin booker was having a good summer now he's having a good camp you know or or something like that you know it's mm-hmm. A lot of times, even the newer buzz in quotations that you're hearing is buzz that you've already heard before. And so, yeah, I do think we need to make you like a video or like a montage of you like getting ready for game day or something, <laughs> you know, maybe putting on so, some eye black, you know, pulling out the pulling out the notepad from the locker and, you know, getting get you know, my... ready to go to town. Thank you so much, Brett Yormark. You, you could get it. We could get it voiced over by the movie guy. You know, the last no time world. Swain suited up for a game, Jalen Daniels threw for a school record, five hundred and forty some yards. True. I don't even remember how many days it. I need. I'll probably do it in a story this week where I mention how many days it's been since the last time they they took the field, but. I'm excited for the season, Kevin. Um, yeah, I think a lot yeah, of people. I think are there's excited. a lot to be excited about, and I think. One, you feel like you're going to be covering a, a pretty solid football team that has a chance to be a good football team. Yeah. Um, and two, I think there are a lot of competitive games on the schedule. And yeah. So, you know, it's it, it's something where you're looking at it and, and saying, you know, this could be a really fun team to cover too. And even beyond that, you know, I think, you know, you've covered some of these guys' recruitments. You've covered some of these guys for a couple of years or whatever you get to like the kids and the personalities and, and things yeah. like that too. And, and so, yeah, it, it'll be, it'll be an interesting season for sure. Yeah, it will. But obviously we'll be here Sunday nights to cover it all Yeah, week by week. We'll take it week yeah. to week, Kevin. Aren't we all just week to week? We're day to we, day. we are all week to week. We'll have to see if we can get college game day to come on our, uh, to come on our podcast this year so we can so we can match up with what the football team did a year ago. So yeah, I'll, I'll get on that, Kevin. I'll make yeah, sure that yeah, I, I'm I'll, sure I'll hit up my contacts. I, I am absolutely sure that you are you are going to get on that. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey Kevin, thanks a bunch for jumping on. I'm sure we'll have a lot more fun things to talk about than preseason predictions. We'll have things to react to, hot takes, cold takes, all sorts of takes coming your way over the course of the season. Um, for those watching on YouTube, thank you as always for checking out the YouTube channel. Make sure you're subscribed and make sure you're liking videos and do us a favor. And if you're made it this far, give us your win total prediction down below. 
I'm interested to see what the, what the YouTube comments think. It might be different than what the message board thinks. So, um, <laughs> and for folks that are listening on their podcast platform of choice, please leave a rating and review. It helps us a lot with the old algorithm, which is a very important thing these days. So thank you as always for listening to the fog.net podcast. We will be back. I believe in the middle of this week, we'll do a preview podcast, but if not, we'll be back next Sunday. Lots to talk about. We'll see you then.